is in the 1980s, when people kind of cloistered and hunkered down and just tried to save the farm, his dad, Kenneth, was inviting neighbors to the kitchen table to help him keep the farm and keeping the family and friends alive going, and Del was out there working and had taken over really young. So here's Del. Tell I ran the lights earlier and did a great job with that, so thanks for bearing one of us. So a little bit about the Grace Master Group, I think I'll get into it in this presentation a little bit more, but um, you know it is about balancing nature and profitability because we can't do that. People say you can have one or the other and you're a tree hunter if you're this way and you're an extreme on the other side if you're just going to farm it and, and mine the soil or something like that. We've got to work with people all over the country. And we, we've got to see how we can do this in every area we've ever been. And so the Grace Master Group is a lot of the people that all have the same ideas and the same heart and desire to build community and, and keep farms and ranches going. That's the name of this, this presentation. And this is kind of a fun thing to start off with. So Farm Journal years ago, they did an article about me that really kind of propelled us into some notoriety. So Harry and had wrote for years and years about what they are doing. Farm Journal calls one day, they like, I'm going to do an article on you, so I went to the same spiel we always do. I didn't think they were going to publish it. It would come out a month later in Farm Journal, pretty, pretty conventional egg. That said, we all fight the apostle of regenerative agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, wow. That doesn't sound like me, but this, this sounds more like me. Like messing around, having a good time, you know, trying to save the soil and stuff. But we really have to take time and, and talk about all the things that maybe we've been, you know, taught not quite right in those ways. So we have a lot of unlearning to do as, you know, not just in agriculture, but, you know, with everything we do. And a lot of people have, have talked to me and said, how can you have a stance an idea about this this month and three months later it's different. I said because you have to evolve, you have to learn, you have to see what what's worked and what hasn't. If you're going to still think the same way your entire career, your entire life it's not going to work and it's not going to help the people around you. So back to the Grace Master Group that's the premise of if we help each other, you know, we can really make this thing go and of course, I said it yesterday, but without Carrie, none you know, of this would be going because she's the brains of this whole deal. So I love uh, the Greek and Latin side of things. I love all the quotes. I love the way they, they too, were doing the right thing with the soil and water until then one day they weren't doing the right thing. And so we have to remember that Civilizations have risen and fallen. Um, they were way more prominent and way more important than the USA. One thing we've done is I think we hold the record. Brian Burke and I talk about this a lot. I think we depleted it faster than any other civilization in history. That's not a great record to have. And I talk to a lot of people that they're like, well, you know, my soil's in this shape. How long will it take me to get it back in good shape? I'm like, oh, three to five years, we'll have a roll. You're like, that much time? I said, it took you 150 years to deplete it, and now you're going to hate this, and we can't do it that fast. So we have to think about where we've been, what we've done. When I, when Karen and I were putting this together the day, this quote I have on my phone, you associate with people who are likely to improve you. You're only as smart as the smartest person you talk to. 
and we see this in agriculture a lot, we're very isolated, and we talk to only a few people. Those people may not have the best interests at heart. Now, they're not doing it intentionally. They need to make a living, too. But they only know what they know, and they only have what they have to sell. So this whole premise is get to know those people all around. This is a smart group. This is an amazing group. Learn from them. Talk to them. Network with them. And, and really start to change the, the course of everyone's individual lives. This is in the corner of my office. It's quite a neat little deal. Um, because the other side is completely full of bugs. Read, read, read. If they tell you not to read a book, that's the first book you read. If agriculture tells you you need to not be looking at this way, you absolutely need to be looking at this way. And I just saw Morris and Brad coming up with a, a table of books. Those are some of the, that's some of the best selection of books I've ever got to see. So thank you for bringing those. Fill a bag up with those books. Read everything that has been done because it's going to tell you where we need to go. I've been, I've been devoted AC. I can't hear you back. Well, you're deaf. Come up to the front, Josh. Is that good? There you go. So I've been quoted a lot that, you know, we, if we get this all right, we're going to change all of society, and I really believe that. We're all from the guardian base. God created us from the earth. And, and to think with a creation like that or with a star like that, the genesis of coming from the earth and the way we treat it, doesn't respect what we're doing and certainly doesn't respect what God and the Canada do. I'm not going to preach because I'm not that, that way. So, every day when we touch the soil, when we get back to touching the soil, we work with the Pawnee Indians in Oklahoma. And our goal was everyone needs to be touching the soil every day. And then that's going to change a lot of the problems we have. So we're busy. We have a purpose. Healthy soil has great microbes, same microbes that are in our guts. And when we think about bringing the unity back, touching the soil, healthier soil, healthier food, healthier people, everything, I mean, it's a win win, and we've got to go there. I'm oh, sorry. Just. So the genesis of the Grace Master Genetics is for a lot of years, since 1984, my family used to be in the registered Herbert business for a lot of, lot of years. And my dad was a, a big proponent of trying a lot of different things, maybe, maybe more so in his mind than he could actually pull off. And um, Larry Haber's in the crowd, and he worked with us, he got to see the switch of of how we were doing that on the Herford side and got the, I guess, the pleasure to work with my dad and things like that, even though we both got told a lot of things that we need to do different. It's probably made us the man we are today. But. So the Graves Master breed of cattle, there was a lot of failures getting to where we're at now. And, and it's a, so the Graves Master breed is a four-way cross. I'm not going to get deep into that because it doesn't really matter. It's, it's what breed makeup or breeds that you're going to put that composite that works for your operation. Works for your market, works for your goals, makes you have a ton of money. So there's two things I always wanted to do over in the last 15 or 20 years is I wanted to make, build a perfect piece. And I wanted to make, you know, have the most accountable cow and I wanted to have the best soil. Two goals I'll never reach, but it gets me up in the morning. So this is a cow-calf pair from last summer. She's just an old Grace Master cow. Just doing her thing on nothing but what she can graze. They get 
hardly any other mineral, protein, they get no vaccinations, they get no wormers, no porons, they are all natural. That gap sold to Missouri last fall, and the guy just loves it. He's like, that gap got better and better every day, and we didn't really feed him anything. But we got pretty serious about making money off, off of not too many inputs, because when your back's against the wall, you either get out or you get smart. So that's allowed us to help other people because we were put in that position that we wanted to be, that we were blessed with. Go ahead, Jerry. I love this saying, current ag methods seldom line up with your environment. So everything looks good on paper, everything looks good from a university standpoint, everything looks good from a group that's trying to sell you copious amounts of inputs. All right? Those are grass genetics. They've never had grain. Two herd bulls, a couple old cows picking on some winter grass. We built a breed that works for us because I guarantee you a bunch of 1,800 pound cows aren't going to work for us. They're going to put us out of business. So we took a vet bill and reduced it by 70%. We took a feed bill and reduced it by 90%. Think about that. It can be done. Everyone's told us we need to have cattle in a certain area. And in that certain area, there's a lot of things that need to be fixed. So you might have to give them a lot of shots. You might have to give them a lot of grain. You might have to give them all that. We don't have time for that, we don't have money for that, and the industry shouldn't tolerate that. We need to build soil with ruminants, and we need to do it fast. Let the cows do the work. And I'm not going to talk a, a lot about practices or techniques, because we've got heavy hitters coming in to talk all that stuff. This is where we biocarpeted, where we unrolled a bale of native grass last winter. That's all grown around it, that's all burned up. Okay? We translocated the seed by unrolling that bale. The cows ate what they want. They tromped the rest in the soil. You know, we there's two or three inches of topsoil in that already. In less than six months. Yes, our land is different than heavy clay, it's not sand, but we can do that every place, to a certain extent. God created the perfect grasses, and people, since a lot of our pastures were all farm ground until the 50s, the university said, smooth grown. We've been fighting it ever since. In a drought, that is doing great, and the brome is dead on both sides. God had it right, we messed it up. Listen to nature, don't fight it, and you'll make more money and you'll have a better life. One thing with the dry weather and talking to people all over the country, they've been asking me, you know, especially in an area like this, like what are some of the plants that work really well in dry weather? Well, we know this, and we're a big birds with tree for all fam. We love it, it's a natural warmer. That plant this year on hardly any moisture in eastern Nebraska relative to eastern Nebraska moisture has prospered. It's every place. It, it does amazing things for the soil. It's beautiful to look at. But it's one of those things that, hey, it's come to the top on this really dry year. Are we doing, are we putting the right species out there? So we're not like Josh Drive, but Southeast Nebraska will get 35 inches of rain. I don't want any of it to run off. So we've had the water infiltration tests on some of the soil we've improved where we can infiltrate 13 inches of water in an hour. We have 62% pore space. We have more air than soil on some of these fields. And Nate will talk about it. So this year, since last August, We've had 14 inches, which out here it's like, guys are like, what do you do with all that extra rain? <laughs> so it's different in eastern Nebraska. 
and it's different with our friends that Ken Stewart and I have way down south to get 100 inches of rain. But everything we talk about works in every area. This year we're talking about a lot of species in dry weather. Next year hopefully we're talking about species that do good in weather. So if anyone follows me on Facebook, nobody's going to. I, yes, I take a lot of flower pictures. It's, it makes me happy. I, I don't inside my garden. I don't do it for, for me. I do it so I don't get cranky with people. So chicory, chicory, it's in cover crop mixes. But do you know where chicory shows up the most? And this is a great learning field. Whoever does the seed packages when they redo a highway does way better than any university or a lot of people I know. It's a blend that is suited for Nebraska. And you'll see the chicory. You'll see the birds with people. You'll see all these cool things that are built to thrive in Nebraska. So why do we find things that don't work in Nebraska? Doesn't make sense. Love this. This is agriculture right now. The opinion of 10,000 men is of no value and none of them know anything about the subject. Most people in agriculture now, because we've been taught wrong, do not know anything about the subject that we're trying to talk about. We're trying to talk about doing things in a way that are, they're good for everything, but they're good for us as people. We need to be healthy in body and mind. We need to be healthy on the profitability. But most things we're doing in agriculture, we don't need to be doing. So when I get to talk all over, I, I equate what a farmer rancher is. You know, we, we suffer from the Stockholm Syndrome. We become friends with our captors. So everyone wants to try to sell us something. And oh, by the way, there's some vendor booze around. Please talk to them. But it's, <laughs> it's a practical way. We want to save people money. We want to make people money. We want to have long-term relationships with everybody we work with. Everyone's our friend. Everyone's our family. We're going to be there, or someone's going to be there in the spirit that will help them for generations to come. Paradise tells me, put a couple words down so you know what the slide is. <laughs> Future possibilities. What does that look like? That is a beautiful scene. The future possibilities are things we can't even see in agriculture. We've got a couple carbon groups here. We have people talking to us about you know, reducing emissions. We have people talking about us or with us doing all kinds of things that your profitability is going to really hinge on working with nature and with the people who want to do the right thing. So don't think, I mean, there's a lot of these things that are maybe not as legit as you'd like them to be, but the future is coming, and agriculture has the biggest role to play in, in saving the environment and, and saving us all the resources. And big companies are looking at that now. And communities are looking at that. Municipalities you know, are talking to us about doing different things, things with water quality, <laughs> things like that. We can't see or touch the coolest things that are coming. But they will, they will generate more revenue, more income. But even if they don't, in the process of what they're trying to do, they're going to make your farm ranch better. You're going to make the soil better, and you're going to have better water. We're going to retain all that. So don't don't think about just corn beans or just cows or yearlings or all this. We've got to think about all these things that we don't even know what's coming. So I always say I don't do this. We don't burn up and down the road all the time talking about all this stuff for me. My generation is done. I'm an old timer. 
the future generations are why we do this. And they will not be here if we don't get it right. Those are my granddaughters. The youngest one, Bella. The middle one, oh, Olivia. Uh, Allie Grace in the center. And, and Hayden on the other side with gloves on her feet. That's her, that's her fencing belt. So that picture of Abby in the center, we do a lot of fence. We build a lot of fence. She was so excited we got that whole load pulled up. She didn't know we were going to go around the bend and start spreading it all out. So we got that. It's a very good work. She's very happy. But they get it. Those girls dig soil. They understand it. They, they understand the connection already. But insert your future generations here why we're trying to do this, why we're trying to make a difference. Because we're all in this together. My contact info, you can call me day or night, text me. My phone's always right by my ear. And we get calls day and night. I love the theme that Carrie has brought up, the patriotic theme. You know, it, it means everything to the way I think. You know, we can have, we can make this country great again, and we can do it in a way that's really sustainable this time for our future generations. It's not sides anymore. The politicians don't really care about you. Get that out of your head. You have to work with your neighbor. Because people are coming for what, what we have. And we can't fight that off or protect that or make it better without our neighbors. So we're all in this together. And it's a really cool, really cool way to start doing the right thing. So I love that picture. That's a Trinic Alien and some Harry Gatch in the flag. Fans will love this. Cover crops and never complain, right? Amen. That's what we do. We can make this country way better than it was to start with. By just doing things that have already been done, we are doing nothing new. We have some new technology, but we are doing nothing new. Cover crops, everything has been around forever. I was going to say. <laughs> probably not, so I should probably say to you guys in agony. So, talk to people here today. Take down their numbers. Call them after this. Stay in contact. Find out what they're doing that might work for what you're doing. We know every field or every paddock of grass is different. But there's a, uh, there's a main jest or a principle that we can follow. And a lot of that starts with a fellowship of working with people and using their ideas. And that's what we used to call community, and we're trying to bring that back. Okay. We are actually ahead of schedule, so I wanted to insert this because Sunny asked me to do it. Sunny Evans is going to be here, and she is a member of the Pawnee Nation. And what Del did not elaborate on is what we he specifically did for them, because he's really humble about it, so I get to talk about it. <laughs> so that's fun. But Sunny is from there, but she had a health field come up in her family, and she was devastated she could hardly be here. So I'm so glad we're trying to record it at least. So when we talk about the sacrifices made, uh, we are not blind to the fact that the history of our country is the history of our country. And we all very well know that Native Americans have a different history. So in our career path, we worked with the Intertribal Ag Council. And a lot of people don't know there are 80,000 at least Native American farmers and ranchers in this country contributing to our food system. That is a huge sector, and they're actually very advanced. Uh, the Navajo, Nappy, from hunter-gatherers to extremely advanced agriculture. And Sunny was going to come 
and represent their tribe, and actually we're going to be working more on the cattle side with them. But on the other side, when we were just starting the Grace Master Group, Nate Belcher, who you're going to hear about later, and myself went to, and Del went to the presentation at the university by Ronnie O'Brien and Deb Echohawk. Ronnie O'Brien is a volunteer um, working with the natives as well. Deb Echohawk is the keeper of the seeds for the Pawnee Nation. They, when they went to Oklahoma and had to, some of them chose, and then others of them obviously were completely bored. They didn't get to take everything, but what they definitely took was their seed. And the horror of that story, besides additional horrors, to me is like, they were farming in eastern Nebraska, or parts of Nebraska, if you read the Pawnee history of hundreds of thousands of people, it's amazing, and other tribes. That soil is vastly different there than in Oklahoma. That's kind of like talking to the Sandhill or northeastern eastern Nebraska farm, and they're like, what about rain, right? So they had these seeds for generations, and Ronnie Brunt O'Brien incredibly had gotten gathered uh, gardeners across Nebraska to begin planting the blue corn and eagle corn, two of their most that treasured. But it was a garden type situation. They were doing an incredible job, but they never had a farmer who had more land do this. Fast forward to today, I said to Nate and Bill, I said, well, you should talk to them because we probably can do something. And I was not going to require them do anything that they didn't want to do, except for they did, they didn't do that. <laughs> but anyway, in, in over 120 year history that they've been moved to Oklahoma, Dell has planted the most food corn ever. And it's almost embarrassing to it. Because it's almost embarrassing to our Anglo-Saxon heritage that this is how long it's taken to kind of give a little acres to our neighbors who were in duress and in a genocidal situation to give that little bit back. So my point being is, we all have something to share. It doesn't mean that you're going to have to grow corn or anything for the funding, but you know you have something to share. You decide what that is. And that has turned into enough corn to feed their people and then try it so they get to taste the blue corn that they are genetically, biologically, designed to eat. Diabetes is big in our culture. It's obviously big in theirs because they got food stuff from us that was nutrient not dense. It was, a, it was a nutrient source, but it was not nutrient dense. So eating this food helps their health. It helps our health. So she just wanted to say hello to everyone. Please look up the Pawnee, I'll share it on Facebook, the Pawnee Seed Pre Preservation Society. This is not a mission. This is not just a little hobby. This is a business that will grow. And if you can learn from it, it's really cool stuff to learn from neighbors. They were farmers. They were farmers. They were very much in line with our cultural tradition. And they continue to be today. So I find that really rock with hope. Thank you, Gary, for bringing that up. Um, a little add on to that. I became an honorary member of the Pawnee tribe, I think, three or four years ago. And I was the only white dude that they asked to go to the Oaxacan Valley in, in Mexico three years ago to trade their sacred seed with other tribes from around the world. So the setting of where we got to do that was in the shadow of a mountain where they found the oldest corn seed on earth, in a cave. They estimated it to be 7,000, 10,000 years old. The ironic thing I noticed is the soil below that mountain was so depleted that they had, in a lot of ways, had followed what we were doing. They had Americanized that soil. And so my whole mission down there was, yes, I wanted to talk to these other people from around the world about what we were trying to do, 
but to educate them that there is a better way and they knew the better way. So I'm always very resistant of you know these companies coming in and telling them it's going to be better because a lot of times it's not. So that was a cool segue into into a break. That's not what I've seen, but we will do a break. Uh, cool segue into a lot of things we've been doing in trying to work with these groups as we all are in it together. So sorry, long spiel. If you guys have questions, you can catch me. We're going to keep rolling with this. Let's do a quick break, and then I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.